like to thank Adam Norwood, Hector Cisneros, and Jonathan Haupt for sponsoring this week's webisode. All you basketball fans out there have heard of March Madness, right? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about Mars Madness. For centuries it was said that the moon made men crazy. In fact, the word lunacy is defined as being of unsound mind or round bent. The term also has at its core the word luna, which is Latin for the moon. So why is it that the current crop of billionaires, along with millions of adoring fans and astronaut wannabes, are crazy about going to the red planet? Beats me, so I thought I'd better point out a few flies in the ointment. First of all, there's the staggering distance involved. Has anybody explained that Mars is anywhere from 140 to 225 million miles away from Earth? The Moon, by comparison, is only 250,000 miles away. The red planet is an all but airless, rust-colored, dusty rock less than half the size of the Earth. The climate there makes Siberia seem like the Garden of Eden in comparison. The average temperature of the red planet is, get this, minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Brr. I hate to tell you, but chestnuts roasting over an open fire isn't going to cut it there. In fact, with an air pressure of less than 1% of that on Earth, and no oxygen to speak of, you wouldn't be able to light a fire if you wanted to on the red planet. Speaking of getting there, let me point out a few salient facts. While a trip to the moon takes only about three days, getting to Mars is going to take no less than six months. Think about it. Half a year cooped up in a tin can about the size of a Winnebago isn't exactly going to be a pleasure cruise. Not only do you have to cram enough food, water, air, supplies, and people into the spacecraft, but the ship needs to perform flawlessly for at least two years since that's the minimum requirement for a round trip. If anything goes wrong with the spacecraft, the crew can't exactly call AAA for a tow, or mission control for that matter. Hell, they can't call anybody at all once they get a couple million miles away, since it takes radio signals anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes to travel one way to Mars. That means two-way communication will quickly be lost. Due to orbital mechanics, the rocket can't simply turn around and head back to Earth if something goes wrong either, nor can Earth send a rescue mission. The bottom line is, once beyond Earth orbit, the crew is virtually on its own. There are a few other nagging details that make a mission to Mars seem almost like a suicide mission. First and foremost, the crew needs to be shielded from solar radiation if they aren't going to be cooked when a solar flare erupts. Should this occur while en route to Mars or once on the planet's surface, the crew would receive a lethal dose since the red planet doesn't have a magnetic shield to protect it from the solar wind. Aside from this lethal hazard, there is also the debilitating effects of zero gravity which slowly but surely eat away at the crew's bones. To date, no astronaut or cosmonaut has stayed in orbit for two years. I hate to tell you folks, but nobody's even simulated a two years Mars mission on the ground to work out some of the potentially lethal hazards of a long-term deep space mission. Another nagging problem was logistics. Think about it. How do you provide enough food, water, and air to last a crew six months? You can't exactly order a pizza in deep space. The only reason we're able to keep the International Space Station humming along is because we send regular resupply missions to it. If NASA, SpaceX, ESA, or any other space agency wishes to send a crew to Mars today, they'll be hard pressed to cram enough comestibles aboard to get them there. A prime example of this problem is dealt with by the crews of nuclear submarines. When they set sail on a three-month cruise, the crew literally crams the vessel with as much food as it'll hold. While a nuclear-powered sub makes its own air and water, and would seem able to stay at sea for years if necessary, the problem is, after three months or so, the crew runs out of food. So how will a crew headed for a two-year Mars mission be able to tote enough supplies? When it comes to resupply missions, even those heading to the ISS don't always make it to orbit successfully. So what do you think the odds of supply ships making the long haul to Mars will be? One in two? One in four? Because I hate to break it to you, but those are the odds of a successful unmanned mission to the Red Planet. 
To date, NASA's record is about 50%, while Russia's is less than 20%. In fact, NASA engineers have even coined a phrase for the phenomenon. They call it the Great Galactic Ghoul. If you ask me, 50% or less aren't exactly betting odds. And like it or not, gambling is what it'll come down to when we're talking about landing a large spacecraft on the surface of the Red Planet. To date, the largest unmanned vehicle ever successfully landed on Mars is the Curiosity rover, which is roughly the size of an SUV. To land a manned mission will take a significantly larger spacecraft whose crew will have to brave what NASA engineers call the seven minutes of terror it takes to go from orbit to the surface of Mars. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be eager to be strapped in for the ride down from orbit using untested technology that'll either work or kill you. Now let's talk about setting up housekeeping on Mars. Even if the crew manages to somehow survive the trip there and the harrowing landing, they still need to survive at least a year on the surface. Unlike the Hollywood movie The Martian, you can't simply set up a greenhouse to start growing crops to feed the crew. Being twice the distance as the Earth from the Sun, it's uncertain whether any terrestrial plant will even germinate on Mars. And if it did, you can be darn sure those plants won't grow on Martian soil, which is known to be laced with perchlorate. That means you have to take soil, seeds, fertilizer, and water with you. Then you have to provide suitable illumination. And did I mention the average temperature of the red planet is 80 below zero? To date, all they've managed to grow on the ISS has been a little bit of lettuce and you can't keep a hungry crew alive for a year on lettuce alone. We're not talking rabbits here, folks. But let's say the food issue is overcome such that the crew won't starve to death up there. Let's talk about the environment. More specifically, let's talk about what it takes to keep a crew alive on the red planet. First of all, you need to set up a habitat big enough to house the crew and keep them safe from solar radiation. While NASA has been toying with using 3D printed shelters made from the material found on the Martian surface, this is simply speculation at best. If you can't build it, that means you have to ship a habitat there. Even if a space agency managed to send habitat successfully from Earth to Mars ahead of time, don't think it'll offer the amenities of the Hilton, or even the ISS for that matter. Like it or not, it costs a lot of money to send stuff into space. Just to send one pound of material into low Earth orbit costs anywhere from $9,000 to $43,000. To take the same amount of material to Mars will be at least 10 times as costly. But again, let's say we somehow manage to overcome the housing problem. How big of a habitat can we send to Mars? That's a good question. Not only do you have to ship and deorbit the habitat, you need to include enough food, water, air and sundry supplies to give the crew a fighting chance to survive for at least a year on the surface. What kind of experience can the crew expect? To keep them protected from the hostile environment and radiation, you have to more or less bury the habitat. No picture windows here, kiddies. We're talking about space-faring cavemen and women. Being sealed in an enclosed environment is known to have a debilitating effect on morale. And while the crew can venture outdoors once on the surface, even then they'll need to stay sealed in a space at all times. That means their surface time will be limited by the amount of air they can carry on their backs, as well as by environmental conditions. If a solar flare is detected, they'll only have about an hour to scamper back inside if they don't want to get roasted alive. And when planet-wide dust storms pop up come spring, the entire crew can expect to be cooped up for a month or more. Ready to sign up yet? You'll notice that I've more or less assumed that everything up there will work just fine. Murphy's Law being what it is, what do you think the odds of that are? When something goes wrong, the crew is going to have to deal with the problem on their own. No ET phone home since a phone call is out of the question. If a member of the crew gets sick or injured, who's going to be the doctor? Even if you send a doctor as part of the crew, what happens if he or she is injured or killed? Heck, what if some other vital system goes on the fritz? If any technology involved in supplying air, water, or food has a hiccup, it's either fix the problem or die trying. They didn't name the Red Planet for the God of War for nothing. It's going to be a battle just to stay alive there. 
Now, I'm not saying we won't ever be able to go to Mars. It's just that current technology being what it is, it seems like utter madness to think we can send a mission to the red planet anytime soon with a reasonable expectation of success. And another thing, the damn planet isn't even red. It's as orange as a pumpkin for crying out loud. Take a good hard look up in the night sky the next time Mars is visible and tell me the thing's red. It's as orange as Florida's favorite fruit. Will Mars madness never end? Let me know with your comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell.